Okay, um, let's get started here. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Those that, that are on here now. I can hear you. Um, all right, thank you. Um, let's see. All right, um, let me begin with a couple of announcements. So, um, I mean, you know, just looking ahead here, we're, we're kind of coming up towards the end of stuff here for the semester. Um, I had originally had some um, some stuff uh, for next week, uh, which is a half week, but I decided to go ahead and um, push that back. So basically, I don't have anything due next week. Give us a little bit of a break. Um, and I'm thinking that I'm probably not going to have our um, help session next week either, or our class session here. So, um, so, so we've got the current problem set that I'll talk about here in a bit due on Friday as usual, but then we won't have anything until we come back um, after the Thanksgiving break. So, so yeah, the, the one, the material I talk about here for the um, assembly language won't be due for um, a, a bit yet then. So, and basically, I mean, you know, we've got, I guess, two full weeks and then finals week. So, um, um, so, so, so this will, once you um, finish up the assembly language um, problem set that's due on Friday this week, that's basically the end of, of our part four from the textbook. Um, and then I'm going to try to cover just two more chapters, I think. So we'll, we'll cover the um, um, processor and the reduced instruction set, so process structure and function. So I had been thinking about doing maybe a little bit more, but I think we'll just do those two. Um, so, so we'll do those for the, the two full weeks that we have, and then we'll just have our test two. So, so that's our materials coming up, basically. If anybody has any questions about those, let me know. Um, so, I mean, yeah, as usual, I do have a few things that I, I wanted to talk a little bit about on the uh, problem set 10 that I did just get back. Um, and then we'll look at the um, um, next problem set and the assembly language um, materials a bit. So it might not be as long today as it was last week, but we'll see here. So um, there were a couple of things that I thought I should probably discuss on this problem set. Um, so first of all, yeah, let, let me go ahead and go through number one. Um, there were a few people that, that had a few issues on, on most, most all of these had at least one or two people had something. Uh, on them. Um, so for one thing, I am the, 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 the solution that I posted here, I am using, you know, some of the definitions that were given in the chapter 13, right? So in particular, like this table 13.1, if you look at that, um, that's this one here, a little bit afterward, where they kind of gave some examples for a similar problem for this first one. In particular, for the um, the the stack based machine, the the zero address based machine, um, I don't know if this is typical. I, I I think the the ones I've used in this kind of did it the other way around, where so you define that the the top item on the stack becomes is done first for the operations, and then the the one below that is second. But but anyway, so that's the definition of that. So if you follow that. Um, then you do have to be careful, especially when you get down here to do the division and, and the subtraction, of course. So uh, a lot of people did have this, you know, although there's, there's, there's lots of different ways you could do this, especially since, um, well, um, I guess I shouldn't say lots of different ways. I mean, there are some different ways uh, since, since the addition and the multiplication doesn't matter here. I mean, we could have done the, um, um, these in a slightly different order. So I could have like pushed B and C first, did the multiply, pushed A and did the add, for example, and that would still be fine because um, um, 
uh, the, that wouldn't, wouldn't change the answer here as long as you do the multiplication first, right? But, but yeah, if you push A, B, and C, you end up with, with C and B on top. And then kind of by, again, by that um, uh, definition, like we have that here, that's exactly the same order. Although again, you know, it doesn't matter whether you have B times C or C times B, you know, those are um, what you call transitive or whatever. Um, but yeah, so that would get you your B times Z. Um, and then you then and that would push that back on there, um, and then you still have A. And then when you do your add again, that's kind of the right the right direction. So it, it doesn't matter for the addition, uh, but it does make a difference uh, for the subtraction, for example. And then if you push D, E, and F, you end up with uh, F on top of the stack. It's supposed to make the top of the stack here on the left down to the bottom, going on the right here. So when you do your multiply, you get E times F, and then here's where the first one where it does make a difference. So uh, the subtraction, you know, by that table 13.1, uh, you're gonna end up popping the two items off the stack, but it's the, the order is gonna be the, the one that was below the top of the stack, you know, minus, uh, and then the one from the top of the stack. That's, that's what this means here from table 13.1. So that gets you the D minus, uh, E times F, and that gets pushed back on. And then likewise, you do have to make certain that you end up with um, the, you know, the sub-expression for the A, B, and C needs to be under for the D, E, F, you know, for, by this definition, so that when you do the div, um, the, the one that's one below the top of the stack ends up at the numerator, um, and then this in, ends up at the denominator, right? So. Um, so yeah, if the definition had been T op T minus one gets done and that gets pushed back to the top of the stack, uh, you, you would have most likely wanted to do the DEF first. So that ends up, um, below the ABC so that you could do the division more easily and so on. So one or two people had it more like that, basically, uh, assuming it was T op T minus one here. So I have a question. Um, so as long as we like take our equation and we put it in postfix notation, uh -huh. is that a safe way to always do it? I mean, even if there are other ways. Um, well, yeah, I think I think that that's a safe way if the operator says, "Oh, yeah." I mean, I think that's where this kind of came from and why it comes in this order. So. So yeah, the, the post fix might not work. I have to think about it, but yeah, it might not work if, if uh, we define the operation of the stack machine differently. I have to try it out and see, so. Um, but, but yeah, that might be why the book defines it like this so that, um, you know, so that's a common kind of thing to um, uh, kind of having that um, in, in like a post fix notation and processing them in that order, so. But yeah, that's a good question. Um, all right, moving on then. So for the the one address machine, um, this one, oops, this one was um, we've had some examples of this one. So so this was. This only makes sense again if you have something like an accumulator. Uh, but again, for for one address machines, these typically don't have like general purpose registers like a two or three address machines do, right? As as we talked about and as they talked about in chapter thirteen here. So, but you know, by this definition, um, you should always have the you know the what's in the accumulator um, on the left hand side of the operation. Um, and then the address that's specified on the right hand side of the operation. But I think most people, we're getting this one. Um, so there's multiple ways to do this. I, uh, you do need to use um, a temporary variable, at least one somewhere here, uh, because you have to, um, you can't keep everything in, in just the accumulator. So, um, you can do it without, this is a, in this example solution, so some people define like, you know, a T or R or, or some other memory location, which was fine. 
you can do it without using any other memory locations by reusing, you know. So if you assume that you've already got X a place where you're gonna, where the final result should go, you could use that as kind of like temporary storage, which is what's being done in this example um, solution here, so. Um, But yeah, in this case, so, you know, the, the, and again, there, there should be lots of ways of, of doing this. And then I saw quite a bit of variety on this one. So, so people figured out different ways of doing that one. Um, for the two address computer, I did have some people that, that weren't using registers. So we're trying to reuse like uh, A, B, C, D, E, and F. Which again is fine, uh, but but um, you know that uh, people that were doing that maybe weren't uh, did, didn't read um, textbook too closely or remember things. So so here you know it is typical for these kinds of machines that you do have more like general purpose registers besides just a single accumulator for the one address machine, um, and those are commonly used. And and of course it's advantageous to use those rather than. Uh, like temporary variables out in main memory because these will be a lot faster. Um, generally, it, uh, once you get the things in there, if you, if you can keep the most of the calculations into the registers, just move the variables A, B, C, D, E, and F once, um, um, uh, you'll get you know a faster performance than having to hit memory multiple times. So. Um, Here, um, I can't quite remember. Um, I think some people, again, maybe had some problems with the um, the order, like on the division on this one. And a lot of people had a problem on the third one, on the, on the last one, the fourth one here, on, on the order of the division for some reason. Um, But yeah, anyway, so so by this one, it's supposed to be uh, by, by the table 13 um, for our two address, it should be uh, A op B. Um, uh, so, so the left one should be on the left side of the operation, the right one on the right side, and that's also the implied destination for the result that gets calculated and saved. Um, so, so, you know, like for example, when you do the division, you need to make certain that the one on the right hand side is the num has the, the result for the numerator and, and the one on uh, I'm sorry on the left hand side is the result for the numerator which should be my r1 in this example and the one on the right hand side is the for the denominator so you do the division then the result ends up back in r1 here um And then finally, so you know, kind of the most explicit, the three address machine. Um, I should use the BOPC, and then the result should go into the first operation. Um, um, so here, a lot of people were switching around these incorrectly. So it ended up with um, either using registers or again reusing like A, B, C, D, E, F. Um, both ways can be made to work, uh, but um, but here, yeah, I mean, you should end up again with the um, um, the, the ABC expression should be on the top, so it should be in the middle operand here for these three, um, and the DEF needs to be um, on the third operand here. Um, to do the division by 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 that table anyway. So. Um, all right. Um, okay, so that was the first one. Um, let's 
So I have a pretty big discussion on the second one. I mostly was just looking that people um, did at least the first part, 2A, um, although I, I was kind of really looking that, that people would discuss both kind of a um, load and store here. So um, just to say a few words about this, um, but I, most people seem to have the basic idea. Um, of course, you know, this is a, um, um, Probably, I, I, I doubt anybody's ever made a computer like this, you know, like a, a two op code computer, right? So um, I think I mentioned this before when I was talking about the um, um, problem. I mean, it's kind of similar to the idea of the minimal set of gates that you need um, for a Boolean logic, right? So what was kind of the minimal um, op codes that you, you could, um, defined to have a, a, a useful uh, instruction set for a machine architecture, right? So, um, I don't know. I mean, you know, I've, I've thought about it and, and you know, it, it would be tough to do some of these other things like um, 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 IO and branching and stuff like this. So, um, but the, the moving, like, like load and store, um, you can get it without too much difficulty, mostly just all you really need is the, the, the subtractions to tell you the truth uh, for part A. Um, so um, a useful thing to realize, um, if you didn't realize it, is that you can use a sequence of two subtractions to ensure that some location is zero, okay? So that's one way that you can load a zero um, into a specific location, right? So whatever the value of Y is, by the definition of this sub, um, it should take, um, and, and um, it doesn't matter what's in X either. So uh, when you do subs from some location zero, um, you're gonna get the, the, the X minus, whatever's in there. So you end up with X minus Y. And remember that gets saved both uh, back into the accumulator and into the um, address that was being manipulated, right? So now you have X minus Y in there. And if you do the subs again, so they both have X minus Y once you've done that. So a sequence of two subs, will take X minus Y and subtract X minus Y again. So the result um, is zero and that's gonna get, end up being put both into the accumulator and into the address zero, right? So, so it doesn't matter what's in, um, in the accumulator and the location that you do that to, the result is that you end up with zero, um, which can be useful, a useful thing to have, right? Um, of course, you know, you don't want to do that um, if you got something in the accumulator you need, so you'd have to first um, do like a store uh, to get that value back out before you do this in order to get some zeros somewhere. So let's look at the, the store and the load. So, um, so, so yeah, I mean, but, but this basic idea could be used potentially to get both zero to the accumulator or zero to some particular memory location. Um, Although, like I said, you know, before you do that, um, um, if you want to get, if you want to use it for a zero to a memory location, of course, you have to, to worry about um, not losing what you have in the accumulator if you need that um, for some calculation. So. Um, so a load from memory to the accumulator, um, you can potentially use that idea. So, um, so this is, kind of one example of, of a program that would do that, basically using all subs. Um, so what we really want is the value uh, here, Z, uh, get loaded in the accumulator. So, so we want an instruction that's like load Z, you know, or load Z, or load um, seven. Um, and that would fetch the value at memory address seven uh, into the accumulator, right? 
So to do this, we do need to have um, some other location that has a zero uh, in it, right? Um, so, so here I'm, I'm, I'm really just doing these initial things to, to get zero uh, here into the accumulator, okay? Although we could also, um, um, well, in this case, we really need to make certain that the accumulator has zero in it before we kind of move on. Um, so, so that that is kind of necessity. So, so we are using that, like like I talked about before, so that no matter what was in this location and the accumulator, we know that after we've done that sequence of steps, we've got zero both in the accumulator and in um, memory address zero. Once we're at that point, um, if we subtract the value uh, that we're trying to do our load for. Um, um, I mean, the result is, is zero minus Z. So we, get, we end up with minus Z now um, in both of these places, okay? Well, and by the way, you know, so if you know that you have, if, if you can get zero into the accumulator, uh, we've seen a sequence now that you can use to do uh, ne a negative, basically, to, to, to get the, um, complement of a value. Um, so that's kind of like a, an opcode there for these first three. Um, so now, um, of course, you know, we, we don't want negative Z in the accumulator. We, we want the original value Z, right? So um, the idea is, is, again, we're going to do something to kind of negate it. Um, so um, if we subtract the, so we've got negative Z in the accumulator. So if, if we subtract that from zero, we get negative Z minus zero. So the result is negative Z. So that ends up just copying the Z uh, into M zero now. And um, then if we subtract from zero again, um, um, you know, so this sequence again kind of zeroes out the uh, the the, uh, the accumulator and um, our memory address by, by doing that twice in a row again on the same address like we saw before, right? But you know, we, we've we've made a little bit of progress. We got negative z. Um, I don't know if you call it progress, but but um, um, you know, we we negated the value um, at location seven here. That helps us because, you know, if we, if we know that we got zero in the accumulator, which we do now, um, and now we take zero minus that, um, you know, we'll, we'll change it back to a positive value um, and we'll get the Z um, in the accumulator, right? And, you know, incidentally, you know, so, so that's, that's kind of a long subsequence, but incidentally we do end up with Z back in the original value. So we didn't lose our original value. Um, although, you know, we didn't have it there for the full time, we, we, we kind of was negative for a bit, but um, we got it back to what we had. Um, so if, if we knew the accumulator was, was zero already, um, I mean, you know, we could start basically at, at this point if, if we knew the accumulator was zero. Um, anyway, so so that's kind of the basic idea. So, so you really have to kind of manipulate um, um, things back and forth to do something like that. Now, the the opposite, the the, the corresponding, you know, kind of storing from the AC back to memory. Um, that's kind of tougher because, I mean, the whole purpose of that is whatever is in the accumulator, you, you don't want to lose that, right? So you need to, to um, um, so for example, you know, you can't start by zeroing out the accumulator in order to, to transfer it, right? Um, so, I mean, to do this, you really need to, to know ahead of time to have some location that is already zero 
uh, in memory that you can use so that you can do one transfer to, to get the negative of the accumulator um, um, into some location, right? Um, So here in, in the discussion of this, this is a little bit incidental, but um, you know, since the sub instruction uses a um, uses zero for the mnemonic, remember that the first bit here indicates the instruction. So it's always uh, zero in all these until until later on in this discussion where where we discuss using some jumps and things. Um, but I mean, you know, potentially. On your assembler, I mean, the way you, you could just do a sub zero to get all zeros in the memory location. Um, if you didn't have, you know, like a, a similar uh, um, um, directive for creating a piece of data in your in your assembler for this machine here. So, um, Anyway, this example really starts at um, uh, address one here. So we're, we're actually executing where we're using this for data. So it's a really, you know, just think of that as having zero, a location that you know has zero before we want to start doing the transfer. So um, by that, I mean, you know, that, that allows us to get a Z out to, um, that location um, so by subtracting from zero you know it's, it's going to be zero minus z minus zero so we end up with z um, in memory zero but you know here that's not the location we want so so we're saying that we really want the the value um, transferred to to location eight right so the idea here though is that um, um, we can't just transfer it directly because in order to do that, so as you can see, if, if we knew that the, the location we wanted it to go to was zero, we could just uh, do the, the, the subs directly to location eight, right? But, um, um, you know, we can't assume that. And um, the, other, the other difficulty with this is that, um, we, we know a way to make the value zero here by subtracting it twice from that location. But again, um, we can't do that as our first step um, if we haven't done something to make certain the Z, that, that the, the original value in the accumulator that we want to transfer um, is, is in a location, um, you know, is, is safe, right? So, so say if, if we have a known location that's zero, we can we can stash our accumulator there, uh, which is what we did. Now we are um, safe to go ahead and zero out the location eight. Um, so that's why we do the subs twice here. So that will will end up making it z minus x, and then when we do it a second time, we'll end up with zero in the accumulator and at memory eight. Um, And then we can sub subsequently get the value from, from zero. Um, so if we do a, a subs on zero, we would end up with uh, now getting the value from memory zero. Um, um, so it would be zero minus that Z, we end up with negative Z. Um, and if we do that with eight again, uh, we would get the negative Z there. Um, And if we do subs uh, the, on zero one more time, you know, um, um, we got negative Z in both places. So the result is gonna be zero again, um, both there and, and at memory address zero, which finally allows us to then kind of negate the, the value at, at um, uh, memory address eight by, by doing a subs on eight again. Uh, and that, that ends up getting you know zero minus z so get a positive z right and again incidentally you know th this is a nice sequence because we, we end up with zero back in that address that we're using 
that we're depending on so that we can use this for the store, right? So, so we got zero back at, at that fixed address that we used to, to do the sequence for a store. Um, and we got Z, we didn't lose the value of Z, or, well, we got Z back into the accumulator, right? So, but, but we did manage to transfer it um, um, out to memory eight successfully after all those manipulations. Um, all right, so yeah, I mean, yeah, this, this was kind of like a little, a bit of like a puzzle or a, a riddle here to, to, to do things like that. Um, so, you know, you can imagine then maybe you, you would be able to actually build real programs. So if you can continue on and build, you know, uh, things, you know, comparison instructions and jumps and things like that, with techniques like that, then in theory, you could write um, kind of like a, a, a cross between a compiler and an assembler, something that looks like more like, like um, uh, assembly language that we might be more used to, and that would uh, translate that into sequences like of subs and jumps um, um, to implement. Um, a more typical assembly instruction uh, just using um, subs and jumps here. So, um, I'm not convinced that you could actually do that fully, you know. So, um, some, I mean, some people did talk about um, addition. So, um, I think I'm, I'm going to not um, go into the details of these anymore. So, so addition, you know, um, um, you can show how to do that without. Um, in a, in a similar way. So, so addition doesn't seem too difficult. If you have addition, um, potentially we already know how we can take the negative of a number. So um, um, we can get a subtraction. Well, I mean, of course, we've already kind of got a, sub, a subtraction instruction, but um, um, but yeah, I mean, in theory, if you have addition, you should be able to build up like multiplication and things. You know, remember, you know, we're positing that we're, we're assuming that these are the only two instructions. So we don't have a multiply um, implemented by the computer architecture. So, so, you know, we would have to actually build up multiply by doing some sequence of additions. But that would require some sorts of loops um, and um, it becomes tougher to think like uh, how you might do. Um, Conditional sorts of branching, so so uh, can, uh, um, 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 doing a, a condition using uh, jump because we've only got like an unconditional jump was the, the second instruction that was given in this example here. Um, um, I discussed it a little bit. Feel free to, to kind of look at the details of that. So um, I mean, you can kind of maybe get there by. Um, actually manipulating the address portion um, as I show here. So, but it wouldn't be easy to, to build up conditional jumps uh, like this. So. All right, um, let me move on unless somebody wants to ask some questions about that one. There's one thing that I, um, well, I want to talk a little bit about three. Um, so for the, the, the first part here, the first part for, 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 for um, both of these questions was, you know, to think about the, uh, the status flags and to figure out which ones make sense uh, that um, are, are going to be needed um, from the descriptions here of, of how they work or what they do, right? So, um, if you're working with unsigned integers, um, I mean, you know, kind of almost by definition, you wouldn't really, the, the, the sign bit doesn't make sense because you don't have um, uh, uh, negatives um, if the processor instruction is assuming that these are um, unsigned values, right? Um, and overflow shouldn't be a issue because the, the way comparison works is it subtracts 
the, the two values, right? Whatever you want to call them. I called them first and second. I guess the, the problem called it uh, the source and the destination. Um, so um, if these are unsigned, you can't really overflow when you do the subtraction uh, because um, you can end up with a negative result, but that's not uh, an overflow the, the way that we mean it um, uh, here. That's not a, a value that no longer fits into uh, you know whatever bit uh, number of bits that we have for our representation, 8, 16, 32 bits, right? So I mean, the, the usual way that uh, um, um, a negative gets um, indicated for an unsigned addition, um, um, you know, again, it's not the sign bit that would be said, it would be the carry bit. So that would, um, um, so anytime, like, like, you know, so if the first number was less than the second or the, the source was less than the destination, let's say three and five, if you subtract those um, in decimal, you get negative two. Right, uh, but you know, um, if this is a compare instruction for unsigned values, it wouldn't be doing anything with the zero bit. I'm sorry, with the um, the the sign bit. All right, so it would be ignoring the sign bits here. But you get a bit pattern that um, that um, um, well it wouldn't make sense it wouldn't it wouldn't you know because because you can't really represent a negative number if these are unsigned integer here right um, so anyway the the these others probably don't really make sense um, um, you know parity is about um, about alignments of operands, um, auxiliary carry um, is only for is for different kinds of, of encoding um, according to our textbook. So, um, so you know, the, the easiest to understand for this, and, and this is going to be the same for part A and B, is that you know if they're equal, of course, when you subtract them. Um, the result is going to be zero, right? So, um, um, uh, in this case, for the definition of the compare, we should end up with uh, the, the zero bit being set um, to true um, when the two numbers that we're comparing are equal, whether they're unsigned um, or two's complement uh, signed integers here, right? Um, and in this th this case, then you can use the carry bit. For the other, so um, if, if they're not equal, the, 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 the zero flag should not be set. So that means it's going to be either a greater than or a less than for the comparison. Um, and you know, if, if the, the first one or the source is greater than the second one, um, it should be a perfectly valid number. And again, um, I mean, there's no way that anything can overflow for unsigned value. So even if this is the um, um, maximum value, and that's zero. You you'd still would still fit in the original bits that you have, right? Um, so in that case, you know the C flag shouldn't be set either, right? So it's, it's only if we're doing something um, that causes a value that can't be represented um, as an unsigned integer that the um, carry um, would would get set in that case. Um, now the, um, the, the case for, um, the, the signed integers, um, is, is quite a bit more, um, complicated here. So let me kind of remind you to, to, to get this one, you probably needed to go back, uh, to, you know, chapter where we talked about, um, Two's complement and um, um, kind of how unsigned uh, addition and subtraction works normally, right? So, um, 
I can't remember what, what chapter that is. I don't know if I want to go back searching for it. But uh, one thing to remember is that um, there's there's what's known as the overflow um, the overflow rule for um, um, addition and subtraction for unsigned numbers, right? So basically, what that says is that uh, if the if originally if the sign for the unsigned for, sorry for the signed numbers if, if the sign is the same for both of them when you're doing an addition or subtraction um, if the, if the 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 sign of the result is the same as the sign for the the two values um, then um, overflow doesn't occur but uh, again if you do addition or subtraction for um, two numbers. Uh, two sign numbers that have different signs. Um, uh, sorry, if, if you do additional subtraction for two numbers that have the same sign and you end up with a result that has a different sign, then overflow has occurred, right? So um, um, you know, if they have the same sign and um, um, if you're doing addition, so, th so this really, really applies to addition. I should probably go back and um, look at that. Uh, 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 description of that rule. So it's back where we talked about um, um, uh, the two's complement um, representations here. Um, uh, there it is. <laughs> I came right to it. So the the overflow rule. So um, so yeah, this is only for addition. So if, if two numbers are added, um, and um, if they both originally had the same sign, if they were both positive or negative. Um, then overflow occurs. Okay. Uh, if and only if the result has, has a different sign. And, and that, that should kind of make sense, right? Because if you're doing addition and they both have the same and they're both positive, then you should expect a positive result. And if, if you get a negative result, um, 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 there was a problem. It didn't fit in the original number of bits that we're, we're using for our representation. Likewise, you know, if, if you're adding two negatives, the result should be negative, and if you get a positive number, um, it didn't fit into your bits again. Right. So, um, so I mean, here for the comparison, we're, we actually need to compare numbers, but we, we're going to we're going to basically use the subtraction rule, which is that uh, we're going to to negate the um, the the second value basically. Um, and then add them. And then, you know, so once we've negated it, we're going to be doing an addition, and then we can detect overflow from this uh, overflow rule, right? So, um, um, so again, I'll, I'll just start with the, um, if we're doing a comparison on signed values, if they're equal, you know, that, that's a relatively simple case. So again, the, the um, argument is that um, um, if they're equal, when you subtract them, the result will be zero. Um, so the zero bit will be set, okay? And if you look at it, uh, you should never get, um, um, I mean, you know, the, the, the sign bit um, for a value that's zero, uh, by definition is gonna be zero, right? So we only use one when the result is a negative number when we're doing signed operations here, right? So zero is considered um, um, positive, right? Um, and it should never overflow because if, if they're equal, um, um, when you do the subtraction, the result is zero. That, that's, that's not an overflow, right? So that can still be represented in however many bits that we're using for our signed um, representation here. So it should be straightforward to understand, you know, how it works for equal. The, the, but you have to kind of work out the different cases for less than and greater than uh, here. So, um, so I'll try and do it relatively quickly here. Um, uh, thought I'd write these out here and try to whiteboard this time instead of the. Um, um, of the dot camera. So um, let's say for less than, um, if I want to compare, uh, uh, check those bits, right? So hopefully that's 
dark enough that you can see it. Um, so the easy case, of course, is um, um, let's say. Uh, where overflow doesn't occur, right? So if we have three and five, right? And I'm just going to use um, four bits here. Um, see if I can, I, I, should, I may, have, may have to put out my whole um, uh, table here, you know, so, so we've got zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, Right, those are our positives. Uh, and then our two's complement for the negatives um, are um, um, in four bits. Um, so for negative one is um, 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 all ones, right? And then it should go kind of backwards from that. Um, negative eight gives us uh, right. I'll put it there, right? Uh, I mean, that, yeah, these should be all the ones with the one there. So these are all our negative numbers. Um, in two's complement, and then all the ones with zero for the third bit um, are our positive numbers here. So. Um, anyway, so for less than, you know, we're going to do subtraction. So we, we've got um, um, three um, and we have five, um, but we're going to change, we're going to negate this one. So we could do three minus five uh, and then just add those together, right? So, but in this case, Whenever the the bits uh, the the signs are different when you're doing the addition, overflow um, is not a possibility, right? So um, um, overflow is not going to occur here. So you know, we'll get our result. Um, which should be the negative two, right? So in this case, since it's negative, the sign bit will be um, one um, and the overflow, you know, we just said overflow didn't occur, right? And then the zero bit is uh, zero, right? Um, now, the other case though, is that um, um, it is possible that um, overflow will occur when we do a subtraction like this, okay? So for that, we would have to have something like, um, um, something that, that that either goes below negative nine. Uh, so when you do subtraction, so so like um, let's say uh, um, a good example would be. Uh, um, um, oh, um, um, right, if you have like a negative number, so like, um, 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 so, oh, I have to do it the other way around though. So, uh, you know, negative three is like uh, definitely less than five, right? Uh, but when you subtract those, you're gonna get negative eight. That, that would still be representable here. So that won't overflow, um, but, um, Negative three less than six, right? So in that case, um, you know, we've got our um, negative three, which is uh, one, one, zero, one, um, and we're going to um, negate six so that we get the uh, negative six here, All right? And then add those together to get our result to see our sign um, overflow and zero bit here. Um, 
So we get what? One, 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 zero, one, right? So here, again, it's an overflow because we're only using four bits for the representation and the result differs in the sign from the, um, uh, the original that we were doing the addition for here, right? So in this case, after we negated, we were adding, uh, both of them had the, the same sign, both of them were negative, right? So, so yeah, I mean, this doesn't fit, you know, this, is, this should be negative uh, nine, it doesn't fit in our four bits anymore. We need, we need more than four bits, so. So in that case, um, you know, it's gonna show up as a sign of zero, but overflow um, comes out as one here, right? And, and still the, the zero bit um, is zero, right? So um, the basic idea then is that for less than, um, uh, it's less than whatever the, the, the zero bit is not set because because that that means that it wasn't equal, so it was either greater than or less than, right? Uh, but um, uh, for less than, um, it, it's either it's when the sign bit is not the same as the um, overflow bit, right? So so either um, sign is one, overflow is zero, or the sign is zero and overflow is one, right? Um, and for greater than, uh, maybe I won't uh, go through a whole example of that, but you can you can um, work out um, the same conclusion for, for greater than. Um, so, you know, five is greater than three um, is pretty easy to do. So you get five uh, plus a negative three, which gives you a two. And in that case, um, um, you're going to get a sign bit of zero um, and it doesn't overflow, right? Um, but you can get an overflow in, in kind of a similar way here um, uh, with a greater than. Of, um, so it's true that three is greater than negative six, um, but when you add those together, you can get a result of nine, which is going to overflow. Um, and um, and you'll find that, that, that there's a one in the sign bit, even though both of the numbers originally were positive, right? So in that case, um, you'll get that, right? So for, for, for greater than, you know, uh, it's, it's when the, the zero flag is not set. So that means it was either less than or greater than, um, and, and the, the sign and the overflow bit are the same. Are equal. Um, all right. So that that was kind of the um, let me go back here. Um, but that was that was the basic idea. That, that was what you're supposed to be uh, kind of um, thinking about um, um, for this question here, right? Um, so um, I didn't look in great detail at, at people's uh, part three, um, although you know I'll, I'll kind of point that out. So really, this is about uh, after compare, you can have uh, different jumps, right? So, so th again, this is all um, in the x86 instruction set here. So that's about um, in the, uh, the, the same place here that we were looking at the, um, the code in 14 here.
Um, I wanted to find that table with the different jumps, but I can remember what that was. What was that 13? So yeah, the table 13.9. Um, so all these, uh, what this really means, if, if you didn't quite get it, is that uh, um, well, you might understand this more um, after reading the chapter from this week on the assembly language, but um, you know, there, there's a bunch of, of conditional jumps, like there's JA for jump above, um, also called JNBE um, for jump not below or equal. Uh, as well as there's a set A or set NBE, right? So these are all different opcodes. There's, there's a JAE for jump above or equal, um, jump JB for jump below, um, JE for jump equal, um, or JZ for jump zero. Um, and so on. So, I mean, that, that's kind of what this table is getting at. Um, um, uh, th these are really all the conditional um, op codes, uh, jump codes um, for um, the x86 instruction set architecture. Um, so anyway, yeah, that, that question was kind of whether these made sense or not. And um, most people said something that sounded um, basically about right on that one. Um, okay. Um, So quickly for four here, because this one, I don't think anybody had a problem with this one in particular. Uh, immediate addressing is an example of where um, the, the value is used um, kind of like a constant or directly. So it doesn't really have an effective address. So, so whatever um, uh, specified in there would be what, what would get loaded into the accumulator in this case, right? Um, and, and then direct and indirect are kind of like a um, one hop and two hop. Sort of thing. So th these are the kind of the, the, the most basic um, addressing mode, right? And, and like I said, most people got these. So, you know, if, if, if 20, um, if we're doing uh, a direct um, and, and the memory address is 20, um, that means that we're gonna go to memory access. Um, uh, so the effective address is, is um, um, memory address 20 um, and whatever value is in there will get loaded into the accumulator. If it's indirect, we're gonna take a, a, an extra hop on that. So we'll go out, hit memory address 20, whatever values in there, we take that to be another address. And so we follow that kind of like a pointer. Um, so we end up with an effective address of um, 40 in this case, um, and the actual value would be whatever's in memory 40, right? Um, Same thing for DEF. Um, and then question five was kind of similar, a little bit more complex. So here we have a little bit more of a realistic, um, uh, kind of uh, an example of like a 16-bit uh, processor, 16-bit um, opcode with some operands, right? So part of it is the opcode, um, the, the first, you know, five or six bits or an opco, a load in this case we're given some other bits give the particular addressing mode, whatever it is, direct, immediate, right? And part of that um, for things like, for example, that use, um, um, let's say like a register or something, uh, these might specify the particular register that's being used. So, um, So similar to what we had before, so, so direct and, and um, uh, uh, immediate and indirect um, are, 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 are same kind of idea. So, so um, uh, 
Um, so in this case, you know, if you think about what the effective address means for immediate, that means that um, we're, we're getting the actual value from the 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 the, the 16 bits that are part of this opcode and operand, right? So the effect, effective address for immediate is, is, is those bits there. Um, so you get the value of 500 into the accumulator. Where if we have direct, we're gonna interpret those bits to mean a memory address. We'd have to go out to 500 and you know from the description of the problem, that should have a value of 1,100, which gets loaded into the accumulator. And indirect, we have to uh, do an additional hop, like we talked about. So you know, we already saw that the um, um, there's um, a value 1100 um, um, at memory address 500. So we have to file 1100. Um, additionally, um, um, so you know, and, and again, by by the description here, there should be a value of 1700, um, and that would be the value that actually gets loaded into the accumulator. Um, um, but then the, the last three or four or five, I guess, um, um, were things other than kind of the basic addressing modes. So some of these could be interpreted slightly differently depending on um, how you uh, um, uh, might define things. So th these are the way that I thought of them though. So for PC relative, um, so you probably could have used, you know, 200 here, argued that, um, but, but it's probably more usual for this to be kind of relative to the PC, uh, where the PC would be incremented um, kind of before the instruction um, is actually being um, um, executed here. Right? So in this case, um, since we have 16 bit addresses, you know, then the, the, the program counter should go to 202 uh, after that. And so if we're using that as our program counter, um, um, you know, so we use that basically added on to the um, um, address given in, in the operand part of the instruction. So that gives us the 500 plus 202 here. Um, so that's our effective address. And, and then we would fetch whatever's in there uh, into our accumulator. Um, so, you know, this kind of relative addressing um, and, and displacement addressing that we use here um, and, and um, um, auto indexing is also another kind of displacement addressing. Um, so for, for all those, we're combining two things usually. So, so normally one of them is like a base address and one is like an offset. So typically like an index over an array or something like that. Okay. Um, here, um, um, actually some people had it wrong, but I, I didn't realize it until later. Okay. So, 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 um, um uh, I didn't end up taking points off this because I, I missed it for some people, but um, um, uh, some people were showing the calculation for this to be 400, presumably getting it from register one, but but this one has nothing to do with register one uh, for the uh, displacement, right? So it doesn't use a register. It uses the base address, right? So, so, so I mean, you have to have the, the operand 500 um, and a base address. Um, so in this case, we're told you know that there's a base register that contains a value 100. So that makes the most sense uh, in the description of this displacement of what you should be using, right? So you should be using your um, operand with the the base address register, combining those to get the effective address for um, displacement. All right. Um, Register addressing, uh, in that case, you use the, um, just the value directly in the register. So this is a very, I mean, you know, lots of uh, machine code tries to use register addressing because that's gonna be um, uh, the best kind of performance. So you don't have to actually go out and register. 
you don't have to go out to memory. Get, get your values in the registers and then try as much as possible, do your calculations um, for your registers, right, to improve performance. So, um, but register indirect, you know, kind of um, like the, the basic indirect, um, we're going to interpret the particular register that's referenced um, as a memory address. So we would go off, that would become our effective address. Um, and we would fetch a value from memory location 400 in this case. We did that, right? And then here, I mean, a lot of people didn't have uh, um, the auto indexing, right? So again, th there's maybe a little bit of interpretation, but it really should be some, um, it, it's, it's a type of displacement addressing. So it should be a combination of the, um, 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 the, the 500 um, operand in here with something else. Um, so in this case, um, I was trying to, to, I mean, you know, since since part of the question was using R1, it makes most sense to assume that you need to add R1 and um, the 500 to get to your effective address. Um, and since this is a pre-increment, so, so, you know, the, the textbook talks a little bit about auto in indexing and pre or post increment. So this is a very common kind of um, um, addressing mode again for like iterating over arrays or for contiguous locations in memory. So, so here, if we're doing the pre increment, we should increment the value in the register one first. So that, that goes to 401, or, or uh, really maybe 402 could be argued would be um, a more um, possibly correct answer here um, just because, you know, uh, uh, we're using eight bits or one byte for each memory location, but but um, our, pro, our our machine architecture is 16 bit. So naturally um, increments probably would go um, to addresses, so, but either way. Um, so you should end up with 401 or 402 in the register one, if you do the pre-increment, then you would add those, add that as like the, the um, offset to the, the, the 500 that was in the um, um, operand portion to get the effective address, right? And then go to there to get the value that gets loaded into the accumulator. Um, Okay, and then finally, um, there was one thing I wanted to clarify here because uh, I mean, I, I ended up giving, I think almost everybody all the points um, on six here, but I don't think people quite were understand what was being asked for here. So so the, the, the determination was, um, 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 you know, again, this is with kind of some addressing modes here, um, and we throw in some complications about pre or post increment or decrement, right? Um, so, you know, really what I wanted to know is which of these end up working as if we're working with a stack. So if, if X is like a, a stack pointer, uh, which of these end up um, popping the top two elements, performing um, the designated operation, and then pushing the result back on the stack, right? Um, Could you do an example on the board for us on one of those? Sure. Like how sure. I work on the stack? Yeah. Um, So let me, let me jump to B and, and C then. So um, like for B, um, um, we'll have to be able to see these here, but but for B, we, we basically have this and um, uh, from the question, we're kind of, you should be treating this as um, indirect um, reference. So, so whatever the value is in X, um, uh, which is a thousand, um, 
we're going to, to go to there to get the actual value that, that's um, being referred to for these, right? So um, um, here, and, and this is supposed to be a like a post uh, increment. So, you know, this should be getting the value from a thousand, um, which, which was A, right? Um, but, and, and it doesn't increment the value there. Um, and, and then, you know, so again, since X is still a thousand, um, it gets the value uh, A again, and we're gonna perform the operation. So, so I, I, was using, I was assuming that the operation was like an addition operation in this um, discussion here, right? So we end up fetching A twice, um, and we do do a post increment on the um, X location, right? So, you know, the result ends up being that we get um, um, A plus A. Um, oh, and, and, you know, this is a two address um, memory. So, so you're supposed to be assuming that, that there's an implied, um, the, the result gets stored back into uh, whatever X is pointing to when you're ready to do the, um, um, you know, after you've done the operation and you're ready to store back the result, right? So in this case, um, X, you know, um, did get um, um, incremented. So um, we're going to end up with the, you know, two uh, A or A plus A back at um, memory address one thousand and one, right? So we, we end up with the two A here, right? So you know, either way that you might interpret the the, you know, to go back to this. Um, uh, the problem here, if this is the top of the stack, we should either end up adding A and B or doing whatever the operation is for A and B. So popping those off and then end up with A plus B at 1001, or um, if we're treating the stack in the other way. So that's an example of, of the stack growing towards zero that I just said, because uh, when, when we're talking about the stack growing, that, that would be pushing values on here. So when you pop A and B off, the, the stack has shrunk, and then when you push A plus B back onto it, um, um, you know, the top of the stack was 1002, um, and so the, when you push a new value, it ends up at 1001. So that, in that case, it's growing towards zero, right? Or um, it is possible for this, for, you know, to have stacks uh, grow away from zero. So in that case, you would interpret if, if a thousand is the top of the stack, um, um, for this to be being treated as a stack correctly, you should get uh, A plus E, those get popped off and you end up with A plus E at 999, right? And in that case, if you're pushing more values, they're gonna get pushed um, to larger addresses, you know, going away from zero. So, um, so there, I mean, you know, my interpretation of, of this question, um, like C, uh, does work like that because what happens is you fetch A from address 1000 and then you increment X um, before we do the next uh, memory reference here, right? So, um, um, so we get A um, and then um, X gets incremented to 1001 Right? And then this is going to fetch the value from 1001 then at this point, which is the B, right? So we get A and B um, fetched out. Um, and, and again, the, you know, the, the, the X uh, has been incremented. So X is pointing to 1001. So we're going to, we're going to add A and B or whatever the operator is again. Um, and then that result, since X is still 1001 after this, um, gets stored at 1001. Um, so the result is that, um, um, you know, we've overwritten B with A plus B, right? Um, and the, the, the X has a value of 1001. So that looks like um, a stack growing towards zero, right? Because now we've got uh, A plus B at, at location 1001 um, and X is pointing to 1001. Um, and then kind of the, the only other one where it kind of works, but it works with the stack uh, growing uh, away from zero. So towards the end of memory um, was this one. 
the, the last one. So um, in this case, you know, um, we would fetch A out of a thousand, but we decrement. So, so X would go to 999, and then we would fetch the value at, at address 999 and do the operation on those two. So um, the, the value at 999 was the E. So we would get A plus E, um, and, and, and X has 999. So when we'd go to the store, we would end up storing A plus E um, into memory address 999 there. Right. So again, that result looks like um, we've got uh, A plus E now overwritten at, at address 999, and we've got X pointing to 999. So that looks like a stack that's growing towards the end of memory, away from zero, right? Where we've popped off A and E, added them together, um, and uh, pushed them back um, above 998, pushed them on to 999. Um, I don't want to interrupt you, but, sure. but sorry. Um, so in the instructions that you sent us, I didn't see that. Or did you just make, or is that just something that you made up to help explain it? Um, the, the what? The, the, the how the stack works? The, the, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Uh, right there the memory address and memory value? Is that just kind of like what you're using to make your explanation? Oh, um, yeah, I probably did, right. Yeah, I, I, that wasn't in the original question. That's true, yeah. Okay, but, all right, but, no, that um, helps, thank you. Okay, yeah. Um, okay, um, yeah, so that was, that was longer than I was thinking. Um, Let's uh, take about five minute break to about eight forty five, and then um, and then yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little bit then about the um, uh, next problem set here. So, all right, so we'll be back in five here. Okay, um, let me get let me go let's start again here. Um, so yeah, I might not take much longer here. I, I was looking through um, kind of what I'd ask you guys to do for this week. Um, most of them are pretty similar, not to mention I just realized that um, this question two is pretty similar to the, to the one I was just talking about on the compare instruction thing. So, uh, but yeah, I thought I might talk a little bit about um, some of the examples that, that were in of, of the, uh, uh, you know, like, like the, the C programs to assembly um, and maybe a few things, right? So this is relatively kind of a shorter chapter. Um, so, oh, and, you know, a, kind of a reminder again, um, um, basically, yeah, this, this problem set is due this Friday, but um, 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 our next problem set, um, kind of going into the next section here, um, we won't have one due next week. Uh, so it won't be due till the week after next here so i'm hoping to get the um uh, these problem sets graded for everybody um uh, this week in here and, and like i said i'm i don't think i'm gonna have a help session next week uh, either so in case you might miss that no. um but that said i mean this this is a a, a, a Relatively short chapter, but it's um, got a lot of good stuff in it. So I hope everybody uh, reads it um, and um, um, understands it. Um, so, you know, um, there's kind of a, a good example right away just of what we mean by, you know, machine language versus um, um, uh, kind of what an assembly program is or what an assembler is, you know, so, so, you know, something a little bit higher level, but that, that can pretty directly be translated from this into uh, machine code and something that potentially could be loaded and um, executed um, by a computer architecture, right? Um, uh, one thing that a couple of people missed on the quiz for today, I mean, you know, the, the characteristic one defining characteristic of an assembler assembly program 
um, or an assembler versus a higher level language compiler is that usually for the assembler, assembly language, uh, each um, statement directly translates into one machine instruction, right? So there's, there's usually kind of a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, each line or each statement um, and a machine instruction in the corresponding assembly language. So, uh, whereas, you know, for a high level language and a compiler, you know, each instruction, each statement in a high level language typically uh, uh, um, is going to end up being compiled into multiple um, statements. So, so, like I said, I was going to mostly maybe talk about the uh, examples uh, here down in part four. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, each of these uh, instructions, well, um, they had some. We had some examples. Um, um, I thought he did. Um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, anyway, the um, I mean, yeah, these are all kind of details. Almost all of this chapter is is using examples, uh, it's really it's really x86 uh, architecture in instructions, right? So um, uh, he mentions the NASM, this is a uh, assembler. Um, 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 it's not as used much nowadays as it was, as, as it used to be. It's not quite as popular as it used to be because a lot of people use the GNU tools, uh, the GNU, uh, uh, some assembler, uh, had, so the GNU tools have an assembler as well as um, uh, a lot of other higher level compilers uh, in their suite of uh, compilation and assembly and linking tools. So, um, but yeah, um, 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 if, if you look, I, I, I'm probably gonna throw up a little bit more um, uh, assembly here, but it's it's actually using uh, GNU assembly. So there's a few slight differences in uh, some of the things that you see between like NASM kind of um, uh, format of things and meanings of things and, and uh, the GNU assembler, So, but not much. So, I mean, they're both the x86 uh, instruction set, you know, so they're both assembling down to um, machine language meant to re run on an x86 architecture, an Intel x86 architecture. Um, all right, so because, I mean, pretty much like all of the problems that I gave you, and, and I don't think that this problem set's going to take people as much time as some other ones, um, but, but they're all pretty much of the same kind of thing. So um, um, either writing a program for from from some from some this x86 assembly instructions or write some x86 instructions from a program um, or things like that. So, um, So I thought I might talk mostly about this one um, because um, um, I, I did get a chance to try compiling it and um, taking a look at it. So um, but um, in our textbook, they gave an example of a um, supposedly of, of a result of, of compiling it through some C compiler. So I don't know which C compiler they were using here. Um, but um, I thought I would try and, and kind of step through this a little bit. Uh, the, uh, it's the, it's uh, the, the one that was supposedly programmed by hand is a lot more compact and a lot tougher to understand. So this one, you kind of can. So like, like I said, um, the, um, um, you, know, you have to, to kind of realize that um, you know the A and B that were used. So, so this is just like a little function to calculate the greatest common denominator, right? So um, um, I guess you could kind of 
walk through this yourself and prove to yourself, you know, so if you pass in, you know, two numbers, you should end up returning a result. That's the greatest common um, divisor, I should say, um, um, between those two values, right? So if I pass in, um, um, I don't know, like, well, I mean, trivial things like five and 15, of course, the greatest common divisor is five, but, but that's that's the basic idea is what this should be calculating. That should be what gets returned here. So, um, so we supposedly have um, B in register the B and uh, A in register B, a little bit confusingly, right? So um, some things that are happening here. So I don't think I'll step through everything, but so for example, um, yeah, I think that this first one, like they said, this this first move doesn't make a lot of sense. So so especially um, 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 but I believe that. Um, what the moves, yeah, I mean, the, the move should be, you know, this is the source and then this is the destination um, on these off codes, you know, so here we can directly see, uh, so it's easy to spot things like that. So, so this must be where we're moving one here. So, so A, EAX register, so these are registers, um, um, EA, EB, um, so on uh, in the x86. Um, so this must be assigning a uh, one to B where we're using uh, register EAX for B here, right? Um, um, so like they said, I mean, they move it around a bit. Um, so um, initially B is in register D, uh, but um, I think we end up probably returning uh, the value in EAX maybe, uh, if I remember right. Um, but let, let's, let's kind of like start here. So assume that, um, um, register B has the A in it, like, like we said here at the start. So kind of what happens here when you do a test like this, um, um, you can look up the test instruction, um, but it's basically being used to test if it's a, a zero or not. Uh, here. Um, so yeah, instead of like loading a zero into a register and then doing a compare, uh, they test it against itself. So I think test, if you read read the um, um, description of test, it, it does like a bitwise and. So basically, if, if, the, if you do a, a test between the, the, the two values, the, the, the same value, the bitwise and, the results are going to be the same. So if the, the if, if the value was originally zero, um, you're going to end up with the zero flag being set, right? Only if the, the value is zero. And if it was not zero, um, um, you won't get it set, right? Um, so here, but, but this is basically doing uh, like testing if A is zero, right? So, so if, if A is zero, um, The, the zero bit would be set to one after the test here. Um, and no, so we jump um, if it's not zero. So basically we're jumping down here somewhere. Um, if it's not zero, if it is zero, um, so, so uh, we, we wouldn't do this conditional jump. We would go to the next one. And the next one is, is, is doing the same thing, but for B. So B should be in register um, uh, D here. I think like they said, right? Um, so the same argument happens here. So we're kind of using that test instruction, but um, um, so, so what should happen here is that the, if A is zero, we'll get past that jump not equal. And if B is not zero, we'll get past this one. And then we're, we're into this part here, right? Setting the B equal to one. Um, like I said, so, so that's kind of the, an easy one to spot. So we, we, we move one into EAX, and then we just return, right? So, so basically, um, um, whatever is happening here is expecting the the result that's being returned to be in register A, right? 
But for both of these, uh, if either A was not zero or B was not zero, we're jumping to L1 here. So that corresponds to this part here, right? Um, so again, this should only be testing uh, now, only, this only tests if B is equal to zero, right? Um, so, so, so this only happened if both A and B were zero. Um, so that should have been like an in condition where, the, where there is no really great common divisor between the two. We need to return one in that case, right? Here, um, if B is zero, we found a divisor um, and it should currently end up being an A. Um, or yeah, I mean, you know, for example, if you passed in five and zero, um, um, there's uh, there's really no divisor uh, between there. So, so the biggest divisor is, is five in that case. So, um, so anyway, that, that's kind of what the L1 is. And, and again, what we're basically B is in the register A here. Um, Um, or I, I guess it's, a, it's in register A because of these moves up here, I believe, because initially it was supposedly um, a B was in um, a D, but we've moved it over to A. So, so that's why we can assume that it's, that it's um, uh, we've got the value of B here when we get to the L1. So the, the same argument happens here, you know, so the test. Um, and um, if it's not zero, um, uh, we're going to jump over and do this stuff down here. But if it is zero, uh, we'll get past that conditional jump not equals. Um, and uh, we end up moving uh, this here. So, so this ends up moving A uh, into the place where we need it to for returning. So, um, because, because again, we're comparing B, but we want to return A. So we need to copy A into whatever we're going to return. So presumably this should be, we should have A in the register B here. Um, um, and, and we move that into the EAX, which seems to be the value, the register that we want the return value in. So um, whatever we get into EAX, we do that right before we do a return statement. Um, and then so on. So um, uh, starting from L2, that's really kind of this portion here, this else if, and then the while loop. Um, um, so again, it's, it's mostly using that same trick. So, so here, another test with a register and of itself. So that's presumably testing um, for the, if A is not equal to zero. Um, is that right? So, um, because uh, in that case, we do a jump equals, uh, because if they are, if A is equal to zero, the, the jump equal takes us down here to, to exit um, right away, right? So, so, but if it's not equal to zero, um, we get past that, um, and this is kind of where the loop is going to be happening and so on. So. Um, And then you can kind of see, so there's some subtractions in here. So those are doing uh, the uh, B minus A or the A minus B um, um, are happening down here. Um, and this jump to L3 implements the, the while loop um, that should be occurring here. Um, Uh, just for fun, I thought I would um, kind of see what happens if we do, if we compile that with the C compiler and see what we get. It's actually a lot easier to understand the, the C compiler code here than that code. Um, uh, so I'll show you kind of real quickly just as a comparison here. So here we've got the, the GCD um, function, the same one that we were just looking at. Um, and I've um, um, 
compiled. I'm, I'm running in the GNU debugger, compiled it with the GNU um, assembler and the GNU tools, um, and we did a disassemble of the GCD function here. So, um, so I kind of jumped down to um, here because basically all the stuff you see here, um, this is all, so, so this, this GCD is implemented as a function here. So, so really A and B come in as values on the stack. So, so, uh, so, so normally when you th see things like negative four, negative eight, these are in relationship to a register that's using being used as a, the function call stack pointer. So basically what's happening here is that uh, like, um, 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 like four things off the top of the stack is where like A or B is. I think we can figure it out here from context in a second. And, and um, eight bytes off the top of the stack is where the other parameter are. Okay? So for example, what I meant by it being easier. So for, um, if you look at this, we're just directly doing a compare statement instead of those like tests that our textbook had. So we compare the value that's eight off of the stack to zero. Right, so I think that that's the if a is equal to zero. So we just compare if if uh, the 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 parameter a, which is um, um, eight from the stack, is equal to zero, um, and again um, we jump if it's not equal somewhere. So so we're actually jumping um, to the else part here. So you can see that if it's not equal, we we jump to this address, which is my greatest common denominator function plus thirty five. So that's down here, right? Uh, but but if, if A is equal to zero, um, then we compare the other parameter. So presumably, um, um, you know, again, I think four from the stack is A and, and eight off the top of the stack is B. So we compare if B is equal to zero. Um, and if it's not equal, again, we jump to that same place, 35, which gives us to the else part here. Otherwise, if we get past both of those jumps, uh, we're right here. For the b equals one again, so we move um, um, one to be able to so notice that. So this is re reversed, I think, from from what the the NASM um, convention is. So that that was one of the differences, I believe. I I, I don't do assembly enough to can remember, but but yeah. So I think for the NASM mostly. You know, like, like, for example, if you look at moves, um, it, is, it assumes that the source is the second opera and, and the destination is the first one, right? Uh, but here, here, if we look at the, the GNU um, assembly or disassembly, um, it looks like it's reversed from that. So the first one is the source and the second one is the destination. So we end up moving one into um, um, eight values off the stack. So we end up moving one into B here. Right, uh, and then we jump to eighty-seven, uh, and that really actually gets us down to the return. So it, it, uh, this this moves B onto EAX. So again, um, um, by convention on the operating system here, I believe that the return value being returned from function should normally be in register A. So that's why it moves the value for B, which is eight from the top of the stack, into EAX. Um, it does something to pop. So this is like popping the, uh, the, the um, and this, this is for function call and returns basically. And then, and then it hits the return statement. So. Um, okay, but then remember, so, so if, if A was not equal to zero or B was not equal to zero, um, we jumped to an offset of 35, so we go down here. So this, that's actually doing this portion here. So again, we compare if B is equal to zero, right? Um, and um, in this case, um, I'm sorry, we compare, in this case, uh, again, we, we jump, if it's not equal, we're gonna be jumping down at the else part. Um, otherwise we um, um, are moving, uh, presumably moving A into B. So this move here 
Um, yeah, so, so again, four off the top of the stack is probably A. So we move that into actually the value EAX that we want to return here. Um, and then we move uh, the EX into B. So, um, and, then, and then again, we come kind of to the end of the routine and return. So. Uh, and then here we should be um, checking if A is not equal to zero um, at that point. So that should be the, um, um, the final else if down here. Um, So that was, you know, if I go back a little bit, that's for both of these jump not equals. Um, um, yeah, this one in particular. So, so uh, 49 should be the, uh, plus 49 should be the beginning of the final else if down here, so. Um, so again, we're comparing A to zero for this part. Um, and, and again, if, if it's not equal, we stay in here. So if it's equal, we're going to jump out of here and return, right? And so that's why there's jump equal this time to get the return. Um, And yeah, I don't completely follow you. So yeah, jump down to 79 for some reason on the compiler, which does some things. And then I mean, basically the loop uh, must be happening here. So the, and then this jumps back to that instruction 57. So, um, uh, anyway, yeah, so, you know, we don't have to go through the, all the details of that, but um, but yeah, in this case, you know, this is this is a bit easier than the textbook, at least for me, um, um, because it's directly using like compare values to zero, um, and um, um, instead of you know some of those uh, tricks like it was using in our textbook, um, um, the uh, like the test of, of a register to itself. Um, or, or even here, this, this is even tougher to um, kind of parse out if you, if you try and get into it. So. Um, okay, um, yeah, I, I think that that was kind of, I'm, I'm going to maybe wrap up with that. that. That was mostly what I wanted to talk about, just, just Give some examples of that. So most all of the um, problems for this current problem set that you guys should be working on here before our uh, little Thanksgiving break um, um, are similar, you know, so, so either, either taking some C code and doing something like that, or, or maybe taking a, a little bit of a snippet of some assembly code and kind of trying to think of what it might mean for a higher level language, um, things like that. Um, all right. Anybody want to ask any questions before I kind of wrap things up here? Um, if not, I'll go ahead and end the session. You know, um, have a good Thanksgiving. Um, take a little break if you can. Um, and um, yeah, and, and I guess I'll see you guys later. Um, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to send them um, um, by email or whatever. So, um, and that's it. I'll see you guys later then.